Well, good morning, everybody. It is great to see you. Welcome to Celebration Baptist Church. I'm really glad that you're here. If today's the first time that you've ever been with us, man, really welcome. Really hope you have a great time. Hope you've enjoyed yourself so far. My name is David Emmert. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm really looking forward to this part in our service where we get to take a look into the Word, and and I just can't wait for it. It's going to be really great today. Um, We're in the book of Hebrews. What we do is we spend a lot of time working through different books of the Bible, so that's where we are today. Uh, Hebrews is a really challenging book. You can go ahead and start turning there if you brought your Bible with you. If you didn't bring your Bible with with you, not to worry, in the row in front of you beneath the seat, you'll find a Bible there. You may have to look to the left or the right, but that's okay. Take a Bible off of that uh, little rack, take it home, give it to a friend. We just want to know that you're using it. Uh, But the book of Hebrews is written to a group of people who had become Christians. They'd gotten involved in the church. And they did so at a time when it was still culturally uh, okay to be both in the church and still involved in the Jewish world, in the synagogue, at the temple. It wasn't really seen as at all a conflict. And then as time goes on, the church begins to become more and more different, more and more separated from uh, the, the Jewish world. And persecution started, it gets to be tough. It gets to be hard. And so these people, these Hebrews, are folks who are sort of on the bubble. They're trying to figure out if they want to stick with this thing called the church or if they want to go back to their old way of life. And so uh, the writer is writing to them and saying, hey, you all, the stakes are high, and I really want you to stand firm in what all of you are facing here. So that's really what the book of Hebrews is, is all about. And today, it's, uh, it's, I'm going to be honest with you, the scripture we're going to get into today, it's a real gut check. I mean, it's going to press in and kind of get in your face a little bit. That's what he does uh, with the folks that he's writing to, and, and we're going to come along and be a part of that. So, so be prepared for that uh, as we get going a little bit today. So open up to Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, we'll be getting there in just a little bit. And let's uh, begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Well, Lord, what a good and gracious God you are. We celebrate you. And we know that you want all things good for us, and we know that your word is a part of that. So we come recognizing your word is true, and that uh, we will be best off when we choose to follow it. And uh, we just love you, and we are appreciative of what you've given to us in the word. Now, today's word is challenging. It's going to push us. And so, Lord, as we get pushed a bit by the word, I pray that we will have uh, our hearts softened by the Holy Spirit and help us to be open to the transformation that you want for us Help us to leave this place changed in the direction you would have us be so changed. We pray all this in Jesus' great name. Amen. Okay, so today is, I'm just telling you, it's a real gut check day. And that's what this scripture does. That's where it takes us. Really, the focus of the scripture that we're looking at today can be boiled down to really about four words. And I'm going to give those four words to you uh, right now. And they simply are this. Christians are growing people. That's it. Bottom line, Christians are growing. Christians are not static. They're not stagnant. They're growing. Something's coming out of the end of the pipe if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. In fact, I think it's safe to say that spiritual growth, progress, and becoming more like Christ is one of the hallmarks of what it means to be a Christian in the first place. It's one of those things that if you look at someone and they're growing in Christ, that's, that's one of the ways that you know they're a believer. If they're, if they're not growing, you, you have to ask, hey, what decision do they really make? What have they really embraced? Where, where are they really? Because it's that critical that we see something, that we, we see some growth demonstrated. And so right today what's going to happen is this writer is going to confront them about this important need they have to be on this spiritual journey. So let's go ahead and dive in. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. Here's what he says. We have a great deal to say about this. To say about what? Well, last week we were together and we looked at this idea. We introduced this idea that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. That there's never been a priest that's been like Jesus. Now, for us as modern readers, we're going, why do I need a priest in the first place, all right? It's very foreign to us. But a priest was a representative on behalf of the people before God. Jesus is our ultimate representative before God. And he wants to explain this to the people that he's writing to, to the Hebrews. But he runs into a problem as he wants to take them deeper. And by the way, and we're going to get into that in chapter 6, 7, and so forth. Beyond, he gets into this, and it's, it gets pretty deep, gets, gets pretty heavy. But uh, he's, as he's thinking about this and where he needs to take them, he realizes they're, they're not really up to it. Here's why. 
This stuff about Jesus being a high priest, it's difficult to explain since you've become too lazy to understand it. Now, you're not going to sell a lot of books that way, are you? Okay? So, I've got this stuff I want to talk to you about, about Jesus being our high priest. It's really great stuff. It's important. This is deep water Christianity, he says. And, uh, but here's the challenge. Two things. One, it's hard. And two, you're lazy. It's not going to be easy. That's what he says. Imagine a football coach. He's got really talented players on his team. They are gifted but week after week after week, they're underperforming. They're not living up to expectations. I'm not talking about any team in particular. All three services, people have laughed when I got right there. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Am I missing something? Anyway, this coach looks at his underperforming players week after week after week. They've got ability out to here. He says, you all ought to be able to get this. You're going to be judged and evaluated based on how well you get this, how well you perform You've got the ability, therefore that means you're just lazy. That's exactly what he's saying. Ever been there before? Ever been in that situation where you underperformed because you were lazy? When I was in high school, I know that all of you all were like the pictures of responsibility when you were in high school, but I was not, okay? And I learned very early on in my high school experience that I could just drift through high school and never study. I could make acceptable grades. And so that's what I did. I didn't crack a book, I don't think, in four years, okay? I mean, I just drifted through high school. If I studied, I don't remember it. You know, it didn't make any impression on me, I can tell you that. And lo and behold, I found a college that would accept me. That was great, okay? And so off to college I went, and while I was there, I met this really pretty little redheaded girl, and uh, she became my wife, and she is like a genius. I mean, she's like crazy smart, okay? I mean, like top of the class kind of smart, like wow, smart. And I'm just kind of macho enough that it, I couldn't stand the idea that she was going to be smarter than me and make better grades than me. So all of a sudden I had this incentive to stop being lazy and start working. And that's where I actually began to do schoolwork, was in college and then later in graduate school. But all through high school, man, I was just drifting along. You guys get it? All right, that's what Hebrews is, that's where they were. And the writer says, listen, I got something really tough that you need to embrace and get because it's going to help you grow in Christ, but it's hard and you're lazy and that's a dangerous combination. You guys are not doing anything like you need to be doing. You're simply not performing to the level that you ought to be performing at. Then he goes on, he begins to tell them now, where should you be? Well, that's a good question. Where should they be? We'll look at it in verse 12, chapter 5. Although by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. Wow. He is really jumping on these people. He says, listen, by this juncture, how many years you've got in in the church, uh, how much teaching you've been exposed to, by this stage in the game, you all really ought to be teachers at this point. Now, he's not talking about the office of teacher, okay? Obviously, everybody in the whole church couldn't have all been teachers. There wouldn't have been any students in the room, right? No, he's not talking about that at all. He's saying this. He's saying, listen, you all should be influencing others for their faith. You ought to be helping you know, the people who are coming along behind you. You should be helping them catch a passion and a vision for what it means to be in Christ. That's where you should be right now. If any of you all follow Facebook, and you follow my wife on Facebook, you know that yesterday was my son's 18th birthday. And we, uh, as his birthday gift, we gave him a discovery flight, uh, which is what you do. You, you uh, connect with an instructor, and they take you up in a small airplane, and it's a chance for you to see if you you know, have any interest in flying. And CJ's expressed some interest in av aviation, and so we thought we'd give that to him. And uh, it was a total surprise. It was a surprise until the very last moment, and keeping it a surprise was like the funnest part for me. Okay, that was just awesome. So we, we worked hard to keep him in the dark, and we succeeded. And we get there, and you all, the instructor that helped us was like the greatest guy ever. He was such a nice young guy. And so he's, he's talking to CJ. He's giving him kind of the ground school and helping him understand some of the principles. And this guy explains to us why he's a flight instructor. He said, you know, I want to be a commercial pilot one day. Uh, but to be a commercial pilot, you have to have a minimum of 1,500 hours in the air. And getting those hours doesn't come cheap. So I can do that by being an instructor. I can get the hours and get paid for it. 
and uh, rather than paying for it myself. And he's also working on his master's degree in aeronautical engineering. So he's a very bright young man. And he's uh, talking to CJ all about how a plane flies and what lifts it and what drops it and all that good stuff. So we all get in the airplane. CJ's in the pilot seat. The instructor's in the co-pilot seat. Pam and I are in the back. And the plane takes off. And as soon as the plane gets in the air, the pilot looks at CJ and says, okay, plane's yours. And CJ grabs the yoke. And he's just like, hey, and the look on his face when he realized that the plane was under his control was awesome. And so now the pilot's starting to talk him through it. He said, okay, I want you to do this. He does this, and the plane begins to bank. And he says, okay, and keeps giving him instruction. You know, do a little more of this, a little less of that, a little more gently, a little more aggressively, whatever it needs to be. And we're just flying all around Tallahassee. We're just circling the city, endangering the lives of tens of thousands of people beneath <laughs> us. It's awesome. We're flying all around. And uh, the pilot's like, you got, you're really starting to get the hang of this. He said, y'all want to do some tricks? And he's like, yeah. So we, we do a couple of things, and, you know, your stomach winds up in your ears, you know. It's just, <gasps> you know, kind of stuff. And we do all that kind of thing. He says, okay, CJ, I want you to line up on the runway so we can land. And so CJ brings around. He continues to say a little further this way, a little more this way. And he gets it all lined up. And as we get closer to the ground, the pilot says, okay, I got it. And he, we land the plane. It was awesome. And you know what that, pilot, that instructor did for CJ? He gave him an experience that made CJ say, that's the funnest, coolest thing I've ever done in my life. Do you think he's still interested in aviation? At least some, right? At least he's curious. At the very least, who knows if it goes anywhere. But he certainly had a great experience. This is what the author of Hebrews says. He says, listen, by this juncture, you all ought to be instructors. I mean, you're still on your way. You're still growing. You're still doing your thing. But you need to be about the job and the purpose of helping other people become excited about who they are in their faith. And instead of being instructors like that, you guys are still dealing with the very basics. You don't need solid food. You need milk. You are so far from where you need to be. You all are still dealing with the basic issues of righteousness. Do you know what he's talking about there? Have you ever met someone who claims to be a believer in Jesus Christ and even the most fundamental moral choices seem to throw them all off track? Or you know what I'm talking about? And they struggle with even, I mean, about the basic things, the big rocks. They're, they're like really battling just those big rocks. And he says, you all shouldn't be battling the big rocks anymore. And you might be thinking, yeah, but all of culture says that this is the way we ought to live. Culture is going backward. <clears throat> Believers are called to go forward, Right? And so it says you can't do that. You can't still be stuck back there at the very beginning. That's not what you do, okay? By now, you all should be instructors. So he goes on, he says this, verse 14, but solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained. Look at that. That's a really cool expression. We'll talk about it in a moment. For those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. He's saying you guys are still on milk because solid food is for people who are in training. The word there for train your senses, the word train is the same word that we use for our word gym. Okay? So imagine somebody goes to the gym. They're a workout person. They're, they're into it. They're a bodybuilder. And you know the people I'm talking about. We've got several in our church. And, you know, their chests are all like that thick, you know, and, and their arms are all like that big around. And they're just like, they're like huge, right? They weren't born that way. Mama didn't drop them out going, Wow. Look at that beefcake. That's not how that worked, okay? They got that way because they were trained, right? They've worked and they've worked and they've worked, and that's why they look the way that they look, okay? You get it? So here's what he's saying. Say, listen, you all should be training, okay, working out your senses so that you learn the difference between good and evil. Now, here's the good news for you and for me. That's not a gift. It's something that we develop, That means we need to grow into knowing the difference between right and wrong. He says, you all should be doing that. And when you exercise, when you're really working out, what do you get? You get hungry, don't you? And you don't want milk. I mean, if you went to that bodybuilding and you said, okay, I know that you're burning calories like there's no tomorrow, but here's a glass of milk and that's all I'm going to give you. It's just milk, 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 milk. What's going to happen to that guy's body? It's not going to work for him, is it? Because he needs more than that. He needs solid food. I ride a bicycle, love to do that, put in a lot of miles not that long ago. Went to pick up Pam after I was done with my ride, and we went to lunch. And she said, what do you want? I said, I don't care what we eat as long as a piece of meat about that thick, okay? I just don't care. Otherwise, we can do whatever. I was starving. The exercise made me hungry. 
He says, listen, you all ought to be hungry. You ought to be craving solid food. You ought to be you know, training yourself and, and learning the difference between right and wrong. You shouldn't be having to go back to the basics again. What are you doing? You're, you're too far along with this. Why is he pounding away on this? Because Christians are growing people, right? Christians are growing people. You've got to be growing. You can't be just rehashing the same old things. Now he's going to give us a quick glimpse at some of the things they were just rehashing. Okay, some of the things they were stuck on this little like wheel, like this, you know, like a like a mouse in a maze kind of thing. What is it that they're keeping rehashing? Here it is in chapter six, verse one. Therefore, leaving the elementary message about the Messiah, let us go on to maturity. Not laying, and here comes his list. He's got six things. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. All right, now, here's what he says. He says, look, you guys, instead of growing on to maturity, you're stuck dealing with the same old things, the same old arguments over and over and over again. And they're really basic. And he hits them with a list of six. These six can be broken into pairs of two. So there's three pairs of two. So three issues where they can, can kind of keep getting stuck, keep rehashing the same old, same old, same old, same old. Y'all with me? Okay, so what are these three pairs? Where do these people keep getting stuck? The first two have to do with the fundamentals of how we become a Christian. So the first one is repentance from dead works. That's sin, right? He says you all are stuck on the same thing. In other words, some of you all are having to repent for the same sin over and over and over and over again. You're not making any headway. Now, most all of us understand what it's like to deal with a habitual sin. It can take sometimes years to see final victory over that particular sin. But there's progress along the way. What he's addressing here is, hey, you guys are stuck doing the same old thing, and there's no progress. There's nothing coming out of the end of the pipe. You guys are stuck dealing with the same old problems over and over and over again. At some point, you got to make some headway. And then the next thing he picks up is this idea of faith in God. What does he mean there? Have you ever talked with someone and they, they, are, they are a believer in Jesus Christ, but they've gone through a very difficult, very traumatic experience? Perhaps they've lost someone uh, close to them and that person has died, or maybe their health is in jeopardy, whatever the case may be. But they've gone through something really, really hard and really difficult, and it shakes their faith right to the core. And they're like, I don't know if I still believe anymore. And they find themselves in that same place over and over and over again. What he says is, listen, you all keep asking that same question. That's a sign that you're not very mature. You're on milk. You need to be on solid food. We've got a church member that's going through some very, very difficult things right now, and it's hitting them on every side. It's hitting them financially. It's hitting them in their health. It's hitting them socially. It's just really devastating them. I talked to them on the phone not all that long ago, and they told me, I'm not worried at all about it. God's got it. He's good for it. And I am totally confident that there will come a day where I understand why we've been through this, how it's been good for us, and exactly what God's doing. But I know this, my God is trustworthy and faithful. I'm not worried. You know what that is? That's maturity. That's what that is. You get it? So he says, I, instead of rehashing all these, these simple things, we got to move on. Now, there was another category where people were getting kind of stuck, and that had to do with church practices. And he mentions here washings and the laying on of hands. And you're going, what in the world does he mean by that? Well, back in the day, they still had some very Jewish practices in their church. Remember, at this point, they're still sort of under, you know, they're still part of the Judaism and kind of on their way out. And so some of their worship reflected their Jewish heritage, which you would expect, Right? And so part of that was ceremonial washings. Your translation may say baptisms, but you notice it's plural, okay? Ceremonial washings and then this laying out of hands business. These were things that were done in their worship service. Now, it, what may well have been going on was something like this. Some people in the church were saying, hey, these, uh, these ceremonial washings and laying out of hands, we need to keep that thing alive. That's awesome. We need to keep them. That's church for me. I mean, when we do the whole ceremonial washings or the laying out of hand things, that's it for me. I worship. All right, now we do the same thing today, don't we? Like, for example, this morning, when Warren in that second number went all boy band on us, right? And some of y'all were going, why is he doing that, right? This is too boy band for church. You can't be boy band in church. And I was watching him, I was thinking, the worship pastor that I grew up with at First Baptist Church, Waverly, Tennessee, could have never gotten that kind of hang time. He could have jumped that high and stayed in the air that long. And you might have been going, what is he doing? That's not... That's not, do you see what you, what, yeah, it's the same stuff. You see, hey, the form 
of worship. I understand the form, and you're trying to change the form. I, we're going to war over this one. And the writer says, what are you doing? You can't be stuck on the basics. You can't be everything that happens to you bad. can't be a, a point of faith, like am I going to believe in God or not. You can't get stuck on just the same old arguments about church. And he points the next category is what's going to happen at the end of time. The techno term eschatology, right? He says, hey, listen, some of you are hung up right there. For some of you, maybe you're going, well, I don't understand that everything that's going to happen at the end of time. Therefore, I don't know that I can really be a Christian because I don't get it all. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't get it all about what's going to happen at the end of the age, you're in really good company, okay? I don't get it all. Anybody with me, you don't get it all? I don't get it all, okay? I don't get it all. People saying that, you know, I'm pre-millennial, I'm post-millennial, I'm all millennial. I've always just said, I am pro-millennial, I'm all for it. You know, let's just bring it on, man. Let's bring it on. I don't get all that. You see what I'm saying? Other people, though, they were stuck in a totally different place. You've ever, maybe you've met these people, and all they can talk about is the book of Revelation. I mean, they're camped out right there. They are convinced the locusts in Revelation chapter 7 are Apache attack helicopters, okay? And every time you talk to them, they're stuck right there. And they don't get how to love their neighbor. They don't get how to be a good husband or wife. They don't, they're not practicing any of that. They're not actually growing in their faith because they're camped out on this obscure thing that's really important to them. And that's just where they spend all their time and all of their energy. And he says to them, listen, you can't just stay right in those same little places and keep digging up that same old dirt over and over and over again. I want to tell you about who Jesus really is. I want to help you understand something, and it's complicated, but you all are lazy, and you're really a bunch of babies, and you need to grow up because you're not ready for what we need to be talking about. Wow, that's pretty hard stuff. What's the bottom line? What's he saying? Christians are growing people, and I'm looking at you all, he's saying, and I'm not seeing growing people. I'm not seeing it. Now, when I went through all this, it made me wonder, well, what would happen if he looked at celebration? I would hope that when he looked here, he would see growing people. And this is a conversation that we as a staff have all the time. I'm telling you, uh, a couple of times a month, man, it feels like we have this conversation as, as your pastors, looking at our programming, asking ourselves the question, is what we're doing, if somebody really plays ball with us here at celebration, are they going to grow? Will it, would it help them mature in Christ? If they come up and they, they show up in church and they say, okay, we're going we're gonna to take you at your word. We're going to come to worship regularly. We're going to be in a small group. We're going to be in a Bible study. We're going to be in a T group. We're going to invest our kids in this place. We're going to serve. We're going to do all that stuff. Is there any chance at all they're going to grow in Christ? And we look at ourselves and we ask ourselves this question all the time. And I, I think the answer is, yeah, I really do. I look at our, our Blast Junior ministry. We got kids this tall, and we're already telling them about Jesus. They can't talk, but we're still telling them about Jesus. Because how cool would it be if their first word was Jesus, right? That would be awesome. And then in our children's ministry, and our Blast ministry, one of our key goals there is that they learn the basics of what it means to become a Christian. And those kids are memorizing chunks of Scripture like nobody's business. And many of y'all have heard our children quote their mega verses, and they're huge. They're not little short verses like Jesus wept. These are huge passages of Scripture. They are just, it's amazing watching them. And our goal, our desire is to see those kids come to know Jesus Christ. In our student ministry, we've got one goal in our student ministry, and that's to see our kids graduate from high school and go to college fully in love with Jesus Christ. And to see them pursue with all of their heart their faith throughout those four years so that they will meet a godly person, man or woman, and marry them. And that they will pursue a godly career. And that when they get done with college, they're ready to enter into full-blown adulthood as a believer in Jesus Christ. That's the goal. That's the goal. And for our adults, we've got Bible studies and small groups. And we've got tea groups. All of these things going on to help you grow in Christ. And I believe if you play ball with us, That'll happen. You'll actually grow. I want to talk to you a minute about one of those T groups in particular. T groups are real close and near and dear to my heart. The uh, T stands for transformation. These are transformation groups. A T group has at least three people in it, no more than four. If it's less than three, it's a pair, not a group. And if it's more than four, you lose accountability. It starts to break down. So these T groups meet all over town. There's three different levels, T1, 2, and 3. 
T1 is basic fundamental discipleship. Here's how you grow in your faith. T2 is basic leadership. How do I function in the body of Christ and lead others? Exactly what we've seen here stressed in the book of Hebrews. And then T3, we get into some of the more advanced stuff. We get into some of the harder doctrine and stuff like that in T3. And the goal is that you come in and you go through a T group as a student, as a participant, and then you go through the same material again another time, this time as a teacher, because we take the Great Commission seriously, and we believe that everyone should be about the business of making disciples, okay? I love T groups. I think they're, they're core to who we are and what we're doing. And I've been in at least half a dozen T groups in the last few years. I'm constantly looking for a T group. I'm in one right now, in fact, and we're, we've got two weeks left. And so as we're wrapping up our tea group, and I thought about this day, this Sunday, I went to my guys in my tea group, and I said, hey, would you all join me on the platform on this Sunday to talk about our tea group? And they agreed. So would you all welcome my tea group to the platform? Guys, come on up. So I want you to meet these two guys. They're both become very good friends. And uh, uh, one of them first is Mike Keller. Mike's right here. And Mike was brand new to me. He was new to Celebration at the time that he started our tea group. And so I don't know, Mike, that we'd ever even really even spoken much other than just, hey, how you doing here? Probably just before said the tea hello group started. before that. Yeah. I mean, so our first time to really begin to interact was in our tea group. And then, Greg, Greg, you and I have known each other for how long? Uh, about nine years. Eight or nine years, a long time. And uh, so... Uh, knew Greg. Greg was interested in being in a T group, so I thought, well, this will be an interesting group to put together. And so we've been working away since January. So our T group's about to wrap up. Supposed to be a six-month T group. We're coming up on wrapping up month number nine. But life happens, vacations, you guys get the, you get the idea, right? That, that's what goes on. So we've been in this T group together for a while now, guys. How has it helped you all move uh, on in your spiritual maturity? Uh, one way it benefits is uh, the intentionality of it. We're all busy, but uh, if you've got your tea group once a week and you know that, it becomes a highlight of your week. And uh, so I think just uh, knowing uh, there's other guys that are committed, and I think that's what part of the Christian life is, is commitment. It, it forces you to be committed. What about, I mean, uh, Greg, how has it helped you um, get into the Word more, get into doctrine more? Uh, how has that kind of pushed you down that trail a bit? Yeah, you know, the accountability was, was key for me. Uh, two to three weeks into the, you know, our tea group, I found out I was getting divorced. It was a very painful time, and um, just having you all to lean on and forcing myself to stay in the Word. I did have those moments of, of pressure where I felt like I'm just not going to church. I'm just taking some time off. And it was nice to stay connected to men that were concerned and, and uh, helped me walk through that phase of my life. Yeah, you talked about the accountability of it. And when you've got a tea group every single week, it's like milking the cows. You've got to get back in there and go whether you want to go or not. Um, how is that accountability piece of it for you? I kind of like it. Uh, I was challenged to memorize scripture. You know, I've been a believer a long time, but what a concept. Actually, no chapter and verse. Uh, but every Thursday rolls around and you'll find sometimes you're, you aren't exactly focused on the, on the verse you're supposed to be memorizing, and that's the pastor there. That's the downside of being in this group. Okay. <laughs> He's talking about that being the downside as the pastor. If you yeah. show up without your memory verse done, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay? You know, so it was good for all of us. I mean, you had to yeah. do that, you know, and um, sometimes you don't get your memory verse done, you're behind on that. That never happened to you, Greg? Well, I'm just, you know, I just remember you having that earpiece, and I'm thinking, what? The Why is he piece. still wearing that? <laughs> no, there was no earpiece, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Warren uses an earpiece, so I can't use an earpiece. No, he hears directly from God. That's how <laughs> yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, right, That's right. Awesome. You mentioned, though, there were mornings where you were totally flat-footed. Yep, 5.30 in the morning, waking up, doing my memory, memory verse. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And you know, how easy it would be to blow that off in those times and say, well, I'm not going to do it. But in order for you to have a healthy habit, you've got to have that repetition and accountability of that T group just kind of just stayed on top of you. Been at this thing nine months. How's it changed your life? How's it impacted you? Well, I've made uh, a couple new friends. And uh, in life, you always need go-to guys. And, uh, uh, and so I think that's a big part of it. You, after you've been together a few weeks, you start letting the guard down and speaking to the things that are real in your life. And that's really helped me a lot. Yeah. How about you, Greg? 
You know, mine was just so impactful. I just remember when you, when you told me that, you know, this is, this is a chance in my life when I get a reboot. Mm -hmm. And I can either follow him or I can follow others. And it was just nice to be able to make the right choice. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, there's an expectation. I talked about it before with this tea group that you guys are going to go on after we're done in a couple of weeks and start your own tea groups. How does the prospect of leading a group, how does that hit you? Well, I think leadership is important. Uh, we lead in our lives. We lead our homes, hopefully, as believers. And uh, we lead at work and we lead in the community. So why not press into some other guys that can challenge you on your own leadership? So I think moving ahead and, and getting with other guys to really share what you've experienced in T-Group is very uh, essential. Very cool. Greg, you've already been working on your list, right? I have. You know, having completed three men's fraternities and this T-Group, I just feel it's time to step up and instead of participate, actually lead. Very cool. Would you all thank these guys for being up here this morning? All right, now let's go back to where we started, okay, our time together. And that was right here. Christians are growing people. Four little words, that's it. Christians are growing people. And I want to just invite you today to really do a gut check and ask yourself, is that me? You know, am I a growing person in Christ? And, and if you're sitting there today and you go, you know what, there was a time when the answer would have been yes, but now I don't know that it is. I had a professor in seminary. And she confided to me one time, and she said, you know, when I was in college, there wasn't a person on my campus that I wouldn't have gladly spoken to about Jesus Christ. And now, I'm not sure I would be willing to talk to anybody about it. I said, what happened there, right? What happened? That was a person who was growing rapidly in their faith, and then life just sort of beat that out of them. And now here they are in this stage, and they're not growing at all. And maybe that's you. Maybe that's your story. Maybe it's not the particulars of your story, but maybe that's your story. And life's just sort of beating it out of you, and you're not in that situation where you're growing any longer. You know, Maybe the wonder, the awe of being a believer in Jesus Christ, maybe that's the sort of one-off and it's gone, and you need to reconnect with that. How important would it be if today was like a new day, a day where you could just push the reset button and just say, you know what? Christians are growing people. I've gotta be a growing person. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not gonna be satisfied to be stagnant any longer. Today's a new day. And so I just want to invite you to take a step. Maybe your step is to join a tea group. We're going to, I'm going to tell you how to do that in just a moment. You saw the number up on the screen during our interview. We've got uh, more help for you on that. Maybe it's to serve. Maybe it's to get engaged. We've got some help with you on that. But maybe today is the day that you take a step. So let me tell you what we're going to do. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship. If you've been here a while, you know that that's kind of our normal thing to do. But as we worship today, I just want you to know that the altar area here is open. And some of you may need to come down and just say, I'm going to drive a stake in the ground today. This is my day where I can look back at this date and say, that was the day that I began to see this thing turn around. And I began to be a growing Christian once again. Others of you, maybe there's somebody in your life and you desperately need to see them grow in Christ. Their, their stagnant condition before Christ is having a terrible impact on your life. And you just want to come and pray for them. Again, you're welcome. You come and you pray. But I want this to be a day where change is made, where steps are taken, okay? So let's pray together right now. Father, we just come before you today, and we give you glory. We recognize who you are. We recognize your greatness. And we recognize that you have filled all believers with the power of the Holy Spirit. There's something inside of us that calls us to be more and to do more. But Lord, we've also been given the liberty by you to suppress that call and to suppress that invitation and to live life as we would see fit. And so for some in the room today, there hasn't been a growth step in a very, very long time. And if they're serious at all, they admit that there's been nothing coming out of the end of the pipe in their life for many, many years. Some in this room today know that if the author of Hebrews were writing to our church today, their name would be on the words that he just wrote to the Hebrews all those years ago. And so, Lord, I pray that today is a fresh start. 
I pray that you grant us the courage we need to walk boldly and intentionally, purposefully with you, and that today will be a new day as we pursue Christ with all of our heart. We love you, Father. We thank you for your forbearance and for your mercy that you show to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed and said, amen. Let's stand and worship.